So, first question is a little bit about who you are, what you did before you came onto the council, and why you came onto the council. Um, I uh, um, I call myself a social entrepreneur by profession. It's not a word I particularly like, um, but my work history has been setting up small social enterprises to address um, problems in communities. The first one, for example, was um, a carpet recycling social enterprise in Glasgow, working with homeless people to supply really low-cost, affordable, recycled carpets to them. And I went on and set up another couple of social enterprises, and then moved to Manchester and worked in um, a community enterprise called Levensheim Inspire Community Centre in South Manchester. What well, in Levensheim, <laughs> obviously, and. Um, then uh, for the last six months I've been centre manager at Heme Community Garden Centre. So my background's in small scale community enterprise with an environmental um, uh, environmental motives, if you like. And I joined the council because I could see through that work that although you can do really, really good work in communities and have a massive impact, actually what needs to happen ultimately is some political decisions that will then affect every community. Um, so I wanted to have a bigger impact rather than just the very small areas I was working in. So you're trying to change the system from within, would that be fair? Yeah. What happens to... So, ha so traditionally, um, some of the people at least who try to change the system from within find that they are changed by the system before they manage to change the system. How do you think, um, what do you think the dangers are of being changed by, quote, the system and the, the culture of a town hall, any town hall, not just this one, and how can you deal with those pressures and challenges? Um, first of all, I don't think it's about changing the system so much as changing people's lives through the political system. Okay. So it's not about changing the political system for me, or changing the way things work, it's about making political decisions that have positive impacts on people's lives. Um, and for, you know, good examples of that are environmental decisions about levels of pollution or limits uh, that just has absolutely massively far-reaching effects on people's lives. So it's those kind of decisions that I want to be involved in making. Um, but I think there is a real risk of becoming part of a um, institution like a town hall. I think that's a natural process of where you spend your time, who you talk to. I think it happens in any large organisation and in small organisations too. Of course, you become influenced by the people that you see and speak to. Um, I think we as councillors are lucky in that part of our job is to go and speak to um, members of the community, residents directly, activists, um, to get a range of views. So I think we are um, better able to not become institutionalised than, than you know people who are within the town hall the whole time. And that's why being a councillor is such a special role and why political representation is so important in local democracy. Um, I think the best, there's still a risk for executive members, particularly over and above normal councillors, because you spend more of your time in the town hall. I think the best way to mitigate that risk is to um, make sure that you're speaking to external people um, and speaking to people at all levels, so trying to get a viewpoint from a national perspective, a regional perspective, very local perspectives. So just trying to listen to all sorts of views and to try and get out of the town hall as, as much as possible. Uh, so, that's... You've not been in the post long, so who was the last person you spoke to who wasn't a councillor, who wasn't of the sort of I don't, um, normal people that you spoke to, who actually said something or showed you something that, that challenged the way that you had been thinking and, and made you think, hmm, maybe we need to do this or that a little bit differently. Can you point me to anyone? Or, without um, mentioning any names, just... I think, um, for me, over the last couple of weeks, I've been particularly thinking about biodiversity in the city. 
Um, and that relates to, I, I spent yesterday in my day job at Hume Community Garden Centre where you get a very different perspective on biodiversity because it's a, it's a, it's a site that really is very led by ethics and principles and biodiversity is a key aim of, of that organisation. So I think my experience just with my colleagues there has made me then reflect on how we as a city can spread out some of the learning from organisations like Hume Community Garden Centre um, and have an impact across our city. So I think I have the advantage in that I'm still doing my day job for until Christmas, so I'm getting a lot of external input. Um, but the, there's been plenty of examples of speaking to people and getting good ideas at the moment. I'm just an ideas uh, generation phase. Coming back from moving from becoming a councillor in 2011? Yes. You're now on the exec, which is relatively quick. Um, can you just say a little bit about why you went for the exec post and um, recap perhaps what you said to the councillors when you were asking for their, their vote? Uh, and at the end of that, tell us what you hope to achieve in your four years? I mean, that's a very difficult question, but go for it. As you say, I'm very new in, so I'll take them in reverse order. What I hope to achieve is something that I'm going to reflect on over Christmas and New Year. Um, I've had a very intense series of briefings over the last five, six weeks, and I just want to have some time to digest all that information and take my original priorities and kind of amend them based on what I've heard from officers and briefings and, and other people I've met over the last five, six weeks. So I'm not ready to, to talk about political priorities right yet. And I've inherited um, Nigel Murphy as my predecessor's political priorities until May. So I won't be forming my own political priorities in this position until May of next year. Um, in terms of why I wanted to go for the post, it was a similar um, similar decision to, to wanting to become a councillor initially, and it's just about the level of um, impact and influence you can have. Um, I'm passionate about environmental issues. I've always worked um, in environmental related um, organisations or community enterprises. Um, and I want to bring some of that experience of what um, what works on the ground and how you can involve people in it to create behaviour change to this role. Um, but I, I think if you're if you've made a decision that you can that you think politics has an impact, it's kind of natural to want to <laughs> progress to places where you can be involved in more key decision making and being a member of the executive is 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 one of those positions within Manchester. So, um, in terms of what I asked uh, my colleagues to, well, what I spoke to, what my platform was for getting um, elected, um, it was it was a few things um, that I think are very important to other members and very important to me as a councillor in Russia. Um, and it's around um, the state of the highways in our city and the potential they have for regenerating neighbourhoods. I've noticed that when you get a street resurfaced in a, in a, in a neighbourhood, it absolutely lifts the whole look and feel of the place immediately. Um, so it was about how we can use our highways budgets much more cleverly to encourage active travel and to regenerate neighbourhoods, not in big strategic regeneration framework type ways, but just in little ways every day as we go about doing maintenance work in the city, how we can contribute to street scene and behaviour change. Um, a second one was about enforcement. I think um, there's a lot of gain to be had from reviewing all the different ways the council interacts with citizens in an enforcement capacity and seeing if we can bring those all together um, and shorten some of the time frames, maybe seek to increase some of the penalties and I feel just a huge amount of desire coming from residents about effective enforcement of wrongdoers in, in very local areas and I really want to work on that. I think it's something we need to change and do. 
And then my third thing was around um, public transport. And I, I specifically think that the cost of um, buses is, is a massive issue for the people who are the most poor and deprived in our communities. And it really inhibits where they can go and what they can do. It was highlighted by the Greater Manchester Poverty Commission um, and it's something I feel very strongly about. So I asked for members' support on tackling that issue. Obviously it's fraught with difficulties. We don't have any powers directly over it. But those were the three things. Highways, transport, cost of transport, cost of public transport, and enforcement that I asked specifically for support on. And then I knew that members knew about my passion for um, cycling, environmental issues, climate change. So that was a, a given because they know a bit about me and the things I've done in the past. Moving outside the town hall then, what would you say to people who have, for whether you think they're good reasons or, or bad reasons, become cynical about um, the rhetoric reality gap that the council and other actors have between the bright shining promises of 2009 and where we are now and setting aside why you know what's happened with the austerity and the government and the collapse of Copenhagen there is a gap between what we thought we'd be doing in 2009 and where we are now assume that someone is watching this who who cares passionately about that gap what would you say to them um, I don't I, I think the big change that's happened amongst residents in the city over the last few years is a sense of the need for behaviour change and it not necessarily being, if, we, if we're talking about environmental issues specifically yeah. and the climate change agenda and the Manchester a certain future and those sort of things. Um, what I hear from residents associations for example and people who I know are very, very, very passionate about those issues um, isn't a, why haven't the council done this, that or whatever, it's how can we work with our neighbours in our communities to do something about our local area and improve and influence behaviour there. So I think the people who care about those issues um, are the people who are closest to it, maybe some of the people who are actually involved in the steering group or involved in writing the initial plans are the people who see the greatest gap between aspiration and, and reality as it is on the ground at the moment. For most people who are really passionate about it, I don't think they're expecting the council to lead this agenda in the first place. And I think there's much more of an emphasis on personal responsibility and communities coming together to do things because they're better placed to do it and to communicate with other residents than the council is. Okay, uh, so ward plans, uh, as an example of how the council works alongside with uh, residents groups trying to do these things. My understanding is that none of the ward plans really has any uh, climate agenda that is related to the 2009 Certain Future Climate Plan. Is that something that you're looking to perhaps work on after you have your own political agenda from May 2014? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think there are, there are lots of issues with ward coordination in that I think it is very variable across the city. I think ward plans reflect well, first of all, ward co coordination meetings are tailored according to how residents and councillors and officers want to do them in each ward. So it's a different thing in each ward. The ward plans reflect the difference in ward coordination. And that's, you know, to some extent right. I think there does need to be probably more quality assurance across the whole piece. Um, one of the recommendations from the Environmental um, Sustainability Subgroup of the Economy Scrutiny Committee which I was chairing prior to being elected to this role, was to look at how we could embed that more. Well, I think one of the recommendations will be that. They haven't actually reported yet. Um, how we can take it down to ward plans and ward coordination better. But again, 
I think what is in the ward plans, and is certainly in our ward plan for Rushome, is um, how we support organisations and residents associations who are already working on this agenda to do what they're doing and to achieve their aims. And I actually think having a line at the bottom of ward coordination or even on the agenda at ward coordination that's something about climate change or meeting a certain target, you know, maybe we should do it just to highlight the issue, but I don't think it's going to be an effective way of changing behaviour or getting things done. I think it's much better to inspire people and support them to do it out in their own neighbourhoods. But I think we as a council do need to do more communicating about how important, well, the importance of climate change to the city and to us as a council. And I think that's the bit for me that's, that's kind of hasn't been consistently kept going uh, over the last few years when quite rightly the council and the city have been struggling with with austerity and other cost pressure issues. So we've taken our eye off the ball about talking about climate change and environmental issues consistently. But I don't think putting it as an item on ward coordination is the most effective way of, of actually getting things done on it. Well I agree with you. I didn't I didn't say that it was. Um, no, it's okay. just for example. Sure. Uh, I probably we should wrap up and I'll save all the awkward questions for the next time we meet. Um, but I'd like to give you that opportunity then to um, to begin that process of talking to about climate change. Um, imagine that you're talking to someone who is a bit sceptical. Uh, they think it might be happening, it might not be happening, but they don't really, even if it is happening, so what? What does it mean for Manchester? It's just a bunch of polar bears and a bunch of typhoons in the Philippines. And that's sad, but that's just how it is. What would you say to that person? Why does climate change matter to Manchester? And then we'll have that as a separate clip from the video. I'd say to them, um, that we, do, we don't know the answer to that. No one knows what the answer to that is. And for me, the person who I trust most to have the best answer on that is um, Kevin Anderson of the Tyndall Centre who spends his life day in day out looking at the impacts of climate change and modelling what they'll do for cities like Manchester. He gave a presentation um, to council earlier this year that was absolutely staggering what the impacts could be for Manchester. Um, he talked about a couple of things that particularly stayed in my mind, and I'm sure there's other things as well that I can't remember, but the things that scared me most was um, seeing the temperatures in Manchester go up um, by, I think it was four degrees, but it, that's, there was a range of temperatures. That didn't mean much to me. What brought it home was when he said that at the temperatures that Manchester might be in summer, you will get tarmac melting you will get air conditioning units failing, you will get um, electricity supplies going off across the city because the whole system can't cope with it anymore. Um, you will get really severe storms, you'll get flooding. There'll be crop failure in other parts of the world which will mean our food prices are massively inflated and you can't get access to, to, to food, there'll be food shortages effectively even in Manchester this is. And then he also talks about, as the impacts are felt across the world, you'll get a massive influx of, of, of migration of people coming to this country, and especially in, for example, there's a very large Bangladeshi population in, in Russia, on the Anson estate where I represent. And you, know, you could totally imagine that, um, as Bangladesh is particularly badly hit by climate change, you get an influx of everyone's families and distant relatives coming to Manchester, coming to Russia and coming to the Anson Estate for, for refuge and for shelter. But that will be on top of all of our systems that are already failing. Food shortages, melting tarmac, we don't have enough school places at the moment, let alone with huge influxes of people. And that all of this could happen quite fast. The decisions that we make today are going to be set in stone the buildings we build, the roads we put down, the, our flood risk. We're making decisions today that will have long-term impact for the next 30 to 50 years. 
and these sort of changes could be affecting the city within that time frame, which is why it's so important that we think about it really seriously now and just review those decisions that we're making to make sure that A, they don't add to the problem and B, they prepare us for it.